Hello everyone, this is Luis J. Rodriguez, co-founder of Tia Chucha's Centro Cultural and Bookstore. We happen to be here at this beautiful, amazing cultural space. I just want to reiterate what a great space this is. We've been here 20 years and now we're in a bigger uh, uh, space. I don't know, I've been saying space like three or four times, maybe I've been spaced out. But it's you got to come to Tia Chucha's when you're here in Los Angeles. We're here in the San Fernando Valley. You can look us up at diachucha.org. You can also uh, donate because we're a nonprofit. We, we do everything for the benefit of the community. It's a full arts cultural space. Not only do we have the only bookstore for half a million people, uh, we have arts, writing, theater, music, uh, classes from kids all the way to uh, ancianos, as you say, the elders. And uh, we have, um, you know, so many much programming, and this happens to be one of them. And I'm very really proud to say that I am, uh, I'm be part of this beautiful dialogue we're going to have. This is for this great book that just appeared this year, and I'm in it. But that's not really what makes it great. What makes it great is that it's great writers, great thinkers, and these are people who work and or um, understand the work of writing in prisons because it's a very important area. It's called The Sentences That Create Us, Creating a Writer's Life in Prison. There's a lot of people around the country who go into prisons to help uh, incarcerated people, men, women, children, learn how to write. It's very powerful. It's a way to get your voice, a way to heal, a way to open up to the world, to have, a, 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 how do you say, an impact in the world beyond the limited walls of a cell, barbed wire, whatever it might be. It humanizes everybody who's been dehumanized. And I want to say what we're proud privilege is, is the editor of this great book that here's with us. She came always from New York City. She edited this amazing book. And I'm going to tell you, and I will say it, I got a lot of books about writing. I, as a writer, I always get these books. This is right now my best favorite book about writing anywhere. And I have to give thanks to Kate Meisner. Kate Meisner is uh, with uh, Pen America. She's been working on this. Maybe she'll say more about what she does, more better than I can say. The only thing I can say is my experience working with her has been amazing. She's got a really beautiful spirit uh, for the work. Um, I know we've done panels together, and she's just so uh, exuberant about this work in the prisons. That's very important. Um, even if you're an abolitionist, which I happen to be, it's still important to go into the institutions, work with people, teach them, interact with them, get to know them. Eventually, I like to see all prisons go away and then we provide people real treatment, real help, real jobs, real resources, everything they need to address the issues of why they ended up in prison in the first place. But in the meantime, it's good to be in there. So, Kate, thank you. Thank you for being here at Thea Chuchas in person my pleasure oh my god and so i think what you ought to do is say more about who you are what you do and the work that you did creating this amazing book and then, we'll, then we'll just have a good dialogue like you're in on a little conversation in the living room i can't wait because yeah. you have the best stories Luis. uh hi everybody i'm kate smeissner as Luis said i'm the director of prison and justice writing at pen america there we host a series of programs that support currently incarcerated writers in both developing their skills and putting their work into the world, building community through the walls. We have a series of programs, but tonight I'm going to focus on our new book, as Louise mentioned, The Sentences That Create Us, Crafting a Writer's Life in Prison, which includes over 50 mostly justice-involved, meaning currently or formerly incarcerated writers, really detailing the experience of writing in prison. But I, I think, Louise, what is so exciting about this book and what was such a thrill to make is that it's really a book that meets the moment. Mm -hmm. And it, as K.S.A. Lehman wrote, which I love this quote, he said about the book, this book, unlike any other I've read, takes seriously the beating hearts and curious mm -hmm. minds behind bars. Mm -hmm. And my sense is that, like you said, a few people have told me that they're teaching this book in their writing classes that have nothing to do with prison because the contributors are so powerful. It's not just about those of us going inside to teach, it's these are folks who've lived the experience teaching each other with some allies and yeah, folks who've yeah. done the work, right? Yeah. So we'll get into kind of what's in this book, but uh, you know, as we go through the night, but it, but it is a one-stop shop, I think of it, for writing mm -hmm. through the walls, but really any writer uh, thinking about spiritual terms of writing, thinking about mm -hmm. craft, thinking about how do I use art as advocacy? Mm -hmm. How do I capital 
P, publish my work, yeah. all of these ephemeral questions about being a writer in the world that's very opaque to folks in prison is really revealed through the stories and the narrative essays in this book. Well, let me just say, you said something very powerful. It is spiritual, and to me, my work in the prisons was never a practical, now we're going to teach you how to write. It never could be that. There has to be a spiritual engagement. People in prisons uh, get, um, how do you say, by nature of being a prison, you get detached. Yeah. You can't help it. Yes. And then uh, they're detached from the world, they're detached from others. Some of them, as, as many will tell you, detached from their families. They have no connection anymore. I detached found, from themselves. Yeah, from themselves. It's just it's just a constant uh, detachment of people. And I, I found that when I did work in the prisons, uh, teaching writing, it was always a matter of reconnecting at a very basic level with people. Who you are, why you're here, where you're going. They, they actually have these questions. And for them, writing is not just a practical thing, even though, as you know, being in prisons, some of the best writers are sitting in there. Oh, yeah. They're doing They're, they're doing in this novels. book. Yeah, <laughs> no, they're doing novels, they're doing plays, they're writing scripts. Or, and then there's people that don't really write, but they come to my class, and I have to deal with those levels, and I can't to speak to both of them. Yes. They come to my class, and they take part in the journey, and they take part in the exercises because it's opening up to a world that they weren't ever exposed to, but they realize it's part of who they are. What is their right. voice? And you think about it, the spiritual terms, which I, I really consider, Luis wrote the On Poetry essay, which is much longer than most of the essays in the book. It's really central. It opens up the craft chapter. Mm -hmm. And Luis, you use all this a Aztec symbology to describe writing poetry. And I, and I, I read it, and I, uh, I'm floored by the spiritual approach because I'm also a poet. And so I think your contribution is highly unique and really speaks to the demographic. I mean, we all need this, right? But then you think about spiritual terms. I think of prisons as being hell on earth, literally. Yeah. yeah. Right? As much hell as we can make for people. Yes. And one of the things about that is that people, uh, I bring in the indigenous cosmology thinking because I find that it's very basic to everybody. Mm. It's this, the indigenous mind, everybody has it inside of them. And my idea is that it's the profoundest part of every one of us. We might have different layers on top of everything, but you don't lose it. It's still in our genetic memories, my good friend John Trudell would say. All mm. that is inside John of John Trudell. I know. We spend a lot of time in him uh, talking, and he became a teacher and friend before he passed. But And he became a poet overnight, they say, but he yeah, always had poetry in him. But when he became a poet, people said, what happened? How did you do this? You know, That's so. actually a great moment. I'm going to be doing this throughout the night, of yeah. bringing little excerpts of the cool. book in. Can I read a little piece Absolutely. from Spoon Jackson's essay? Because yeah. I think what you're talking about with always having poetry inside you mm -hmm. is such a common experience. Mm -hmm. And Spoon... Jackson is a very a good friend of mine and we know good friend of mine yeah. too. Yes, we share him. He shares everybody. Yeah. He's a very well known writer who's been inside for decades in California yeah. here. And he wrote an essay called Gift Culture on Collaborating Through the Walls because mm. this dude is making amazing things happen all over the world. And I said, Spoon, break it down for me in this essay. And he's like, Well, I just be real, Kates. And I was like, But there's but there's math to it that you haven't even articulated, so let's mm. get there. But he starts with, uh, and then we really broke down, actually, how did he do it? How did he make these relationships through the walls? But he writes about coming into his poetic voice to open his essay and how that happened, and it, it illustrates exactly what you're saying. So I'm going to bring Spoon into the room, our friend Spoon. And when he calls me, I'll tell him. Yeah. He says, I sat in the far corner of the basement classroom and placed two empty desks around me. Sometimes I sat out on the stairs in the hall across from the class. I always wore dark shades, even at night. I did not want anyone to steal my eyes. And yet, I never missed a poem read or any word said. It was only after nearly a year in her poetry class that Ju Judith Tannenbaum, excuse me, saw me without my shades when we met for an individual consultation. She asked me where I was from and was delighted and shocked when a whole description of the high desert came out. I spoke of the weather being 90 degrees hotter, of sparrows singing, and how, when I stood on Crook Street and looked at the purple and red clay mountains that surrounded me, they appeared to be the whole world. Judith wrote down and read my words back to me. We collected my thoughts into a poem on the page, Heart of the High Desert. I had been speaking in poems and did not know it. 
Yeah, what a beautiful passage. And I have to say, Judith passed, and yeah. she was also a good friend. And a and book about her, Spoon Jackson, just edited. Yes, are you in I'm it? In it. And I blurbed it. Yeah, there you go. So, I mean, these are great people. And Judith is yes. one of those people that went into the prisons and, and provided this, this forum for expression and openness, but also, like you say, already drawing on what's already there. Yes. It's That's not about important. coming in and saving, right? It's about coming in and communing and saying, yeah. what do you have in you? Exactly. Maybe, yeah. you, maybe Luis, I'm stuck on the book, I know, but... I think there's just so much gorgeous language in your chapter. Are you planning on reading from it? Well, let's just maybe start with something because um, I, I do want to say this quote then from Theodore Rocky I put in here. Yeah. It's my favorite line in poetry, which is really hard to say because I love so much poetry. I love so many lines. But this line keeps haunting me. And so this is why I use it everywhere. Theodore Rocky was one of my favorite poets and he passed a suicide. Mm. Uh, he was just so amazing wordsmith and an emotionally charged writer. And I really, it really spoke to me whenever I started reading him. But this line just blow, floors me all the time. And it, and it goes, what is madness but the nobility of soul at odds with circumstance? Oof. It always, it's just like, are you kidding me? This is like, a, and you know, it says something about what we do to people. Because even when we say people are mentally ill, and, but I think about, yeah, but what's normal as well? Is, mentally off. What's normal is crazy. What people think is normal, it's really not. And I find something very interesting, Theodore Rocky committed suicide. I know a lot of guys and women who I've worked with who have done that. It's mm. very sad. Did you know, if you do enough of this work, most yeah. people do well, but there's always these people. And I find one of them was my, a good friend of mine. He became my best friend here. He did 17 years, read my book in prison, contacted me, we stayed good friends. He, he had this terrible pain from he, abuse that he had when he was a kid. He could never let it go. And he told me something. Well, he said it in to somebody else he called because he couldn't reach me. And he told him, um, tell Louie I'm going to be okay. I'm at peace. But he also said something like, um, I'm, I'm at peace because I can't reconcile with the world. Something like that. And then I realized, you know what, that's a truth. For a lot of people, mm -hmm. it's a spiritual battle they're having with the world. Some people can find a way to navigate, negotiate, maybe figure things out, but some people cannot. This is too, the world is too empty, too ugly, too, you know, we've got invasions in Ukraine, we got all these things happening, we got the pandemics, right? And, and, and so much hurting, there's so much hurt out there. And some people just cannot reconcile with that world. And so they're not taking themselves out because I'm totally wrong with them. Maybe something's wrong with the world that they don't want to be part of. You know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And, yeah. and actually, my question for you is, do you use writing to navigate and reconcile the world? And if so, how? So what I do when I teach uh, with incarcerated people that I work with, it's really my, what I've learned. Yeah. So the, whatever I went through, I went through a big uh, a journey myself because I was... Um, a heroin addict for seven years. I was in and out of jail. I was in all youth in our jail, juvenile hall, and I was homeless for three years. I was in pretty bad shape. Mm. Uh, but writing became one of my lifelines, as I call it. And I say the lifeline is inside of us. It's like we're saying about Spoon. He already had this inside of him. Uh, he calls it the realness. The realness. Yeah. It was all there. And that's what you got to help them understand. You're not really giving them something. They have it. Now, you might teach them methods and you, may, you can school them in a lot of things, but you're not schooling them about what, what their voice, what their story is. They got it. And that's what I learned. For me to get through what I get through, I had to get through. I had started with, with poetry. And uh, when I was 16 years old, they tried to get me for the murder of, of three people that I had nothing to do with, but it didn't matter. I was a murderer's role. Which is how you open your yeah. essay yeah, really so, compellingly. Uh, and but that's the nature of the world you're in, you know, where they get you for stuff that you didn't even do. It doesn't matter. Uh, the point is that I started to write them. I started to write when other people were playing cards or goofing around, or whatever. Words were coming out. And I, and I do what John Trudell says, follow the lines. Mm -hmm. He always says that. He says, what I did is I don't know why I started to write, but I started to follow the lines. The lines took me more, deeper, deeper, deeper and further. And that's what I think is what happens when you get a book like this. And when you hit a moment, right, when you're writing and you can unhook from the identity that 
the, that's sort of trapping you, these human identities, and you get into, it is spiritual, like a, like in touch with spirit starts to come through you, right? And that people talk about that. I, this is coming through me, it's not coming from me. And then the human side of us comes in and shapes it up and makes it work on the page. But I think, I think this book is rife with those stories. And something, I always want to bring this into the room. I don't, I don't know if I did it when, um, when we just read this week, but yeah. uh, did I bring in Thomas Bartlett Whitaker at all? You might have. Actually. I might have. But go bring it up again. I'm going to bring it up again yeah. because, Louis, something really struck me, and I think there's no way to talk about this book and the power of the writers in this book without talking about what they risked in order to contribute. The folks that are currently incarcerated I'm talking about. Oh, yeah, and yeah. Um, Thomas Bartlett Whitaker is in prison in Texas, and he already is a prolific writer uh, he, his story is that he was um, commuted off death row moments before his execution. And, uh, and he talks about, and he, he talks about that, and I'm going to read a paragraph or two from it, but it struck me when I was reading back on this text when the physical book came and I had now been some time out since I'd edited it, and it struck me again that what this book has to teach is how to be a writer beyond craft. It's really how to be a human and how to bring your humanity. And this is what this is what Thomas can teach us and it gives me chills. He says in the middle of his essay which is called The Price of Remaining Human. On the chain bus to Texas's death row, I met a fellow condemned prisoner named Shadow. Thrice weekly he was sent to a medical facility for dialysis and his transport was the one tasked with picking me up with the class from the classification unit. Shadow had an execution date just a few months down the line. When I asked him how he was dealing with the end of his story, he shrugged and said he was ready to go. I've never forgotten his eyes. I didn't know exactly how a person could come to look so defeated, but I figured that the state was going to give me a master class on the subject, and they did. Over the course of my 11 years on the row, they killed 161 men. I knew all of them and have not forgotten a single one of them. And he goes on to kind of debunk all of these fantasies that writers in prison have. Uh, you know, I'm going to become, a, he's like, you know, if your celly says he just sold a million books, right. he's lying to you. Put, a, put a blank. He says, you have to write because you're haunted. Yeah. And I thought, you know, so, <laughs> I haven't seen 161 men on death row be killed, but that shoots through me, that idea of you have to write because you're haunted, you know. That's awful. And I actually w was working with a guy that was in Texas death row who uh, was also exonerated and wow. taken off this role. His name was Ricardo Adapaget. I have to mention it because we had a whole campaign to get him off. He happened to be one of these guys that his friend went and robbed a store. The cops came, his friend shot one of the cops Ooh. and the cops killed him. He was hiding. He just happened to be with this guy. He didn't really want to rob anybody or nothing. He was hiding. They happens him more off, often than you think. But they right? got him for the murder of the cop. Mm. And, and I mm. think they even included the murder of his friend. Anyway, they got him on death row. Uh, so he didn't murder nobody, but it didn't matter. He was sitting there. So we had a whole campaign. And this is a sad story. We had a whole campaign to get him off death row. It's hard. It's huge. We had, uh, at the time, uh, national. He finally gets out. We met his family. They're from Monterey, Mexico. Because he didn't have papers, they deported him, mm. which is what they do. Right. Two weeks after he gets deported, he gets killed in a car accident. Oh, I know this is heartbreaking. It's like, well, we could just trade oh. these sob stories. I know there's so many of them. There's so many, oh. and it, it it actually also makes me think, yeah. Louise, that it makes me want to bring up a friend. I've never shared this story out loud, but I'm going to tell a story mm -hmm. now myself, and it it will relate back to the book, Roundabout. Uh, one of the contributors to this book's name is Alejo Rodriguez, one mm -hmm. of my dear friends, and I met him when he was in prison, and now he's home, and. One of his best friends that I met them together because we co-worked on a curriculum was Chaz Ransom. And Chaz was one of the most amazing men I've ever met. And then after three intensive days together, I didn't see him again. But a year or two later, he comes home from prison. I miss his welcome home dinner. I'm out of town. I'm on the subway one night and there's a scuffle happening. Like somebody accidentally stepped on someone else's foot and somebody's being dramatic. And I keep looking at the guy like, that guy looks so familiar. And we get off at my train stop, way top of Manhattan. Nobody mm -hmm. comes up to my neighborhood ever. Mm -hmm. It's very residential. And I said, Chaz? And he mm -hmm. said, Kate's? We stood outside talking for two hours. 
he had through his film work, through my friend V Bravo, another mentor of mine, had just met Oprah. He showed me the videos. We take a video together. The next morning, I get a message from our mutual friend that he had a heart attack. Oh, yes. And what, why I bring it up is that was six months after he came home, and he was such a major contribution in the prison. He was part of the Lifers Association. He was, he was really bringing the community together, and this is a very, very common story that people don't live long often after they've served decades. And I start to think about, you know, the hierarchy of need and how much is writing really needed in prison. But I think even though Chaz passed and it breaks my heart, he lived while he was inside still. And I think there's a misconception, Louise, that people aren't living real lives inside, which I think is a kind of another form of paternalism. Yeah. The truth is that people are living full yeah. contributory lives behind the walls to the community behind the walls, the community outside. And I am also an abolitionist, but there is a way that dismissing all the talent and activity and organizing and yeah. politics that are happening there run by folks inside is really a shame that we don't know the talent. You know, it, it's so powerful. And I actually happen to have my son here and I don't, I'm sure he didn't expect that I was being above, but he did a 13 and a half year stretch in the state of Illinois. Mm. And um, I, I don't know, maybe you could say something but you can't hear him what, what, if you could do mind. But he, he, he tells me how for him, and this is why you gotta be careful how you pose this, uh, prison saved his life. Now that's a hard thing to think about. A lot of people have told me that. Yeah, but he has a story and I don't think you need to get into so much, but more about just why you say that. You wanna just speak under hope you can hear him. Because he's here. Why don't you can't... come up? You want to take yeah, my yeah. seat? Oh, let... No, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just because he's here and he did all this the time. Is and this welcome. is very, for us, it's personal. Because we not only do we have good friends, now I have family. By the way, his one of his daughters, and I don't mind telling people, and my granddaughter is in jail right now. Mm. She may be going to prison. And it's just a, the nature of the world that we're in. Yeah. You know, there's so much drugs. There's so much pain out there. We're holding her close. Yeah, holding her close to my Anastasia. But anyway, just say real quickly about what that means to you when you say stuff like that. Okay. Well, hi. Thank you, everyone. My name is Ramiro Rodriguez. I'm happy to be here with all of you. Uh, so for me, so the life that I was living before I went to prison was very destructive. And pretty much I uh, wasn't going to live. I wasn't going to survive. Um, my mind was not in a good place. Uh, I was hurting a lot of people, hurting myself. And so uh, it was either going to be death or prison. And fortunately, it was prison, of course, um, I'm, with the technicality, technicalities of the case. Sometimes I feel like I may have, I have to do all that time. But uh, the time that I did was not just for the case that I got involved in, but probably because of all the things that I was doing. Also. That's how I look at it. So I really had to make some changes in prison. And... Uh, when I was in there, you know, writing poetry really helped me out a lot. Uh, it helped me to express myself. It helped me to um, not have to tap into that anger in a very violent way, but I was able to do it with writing. You know, and then um, my dad and uh, some other elders were able to send me some um, indigenous uh, teachings and writings and things that I could learn about who I am as a Mashika person. So there were a lot of things that I needed to do to make sure that when I did come home, I was a different person, a better person with a person with a different attitude and someone who I can come and make, you know, make come out and uh, make sure I can contribute and help, you know, other young people that are going through the same things that I was going through. Yeah. So, and then why is the reason I brought up only because we talked about those terrible stories of ones that didn't make it. Yeah. But most of the work I do, people do make it. They do. And they come yeah. home. And they come home. And that's and the other thing people don't realize. Right? Yeah. Well, I always think about it this way. Tell me if this resonates with you. People will say to me too, often formerly incarcerated, you know, it's complex because prison interrupted a, the path I was on that I was going, I was going to be dead or in prison. That's often what's said, or really hurt somebody or keep yeah. hurting people and keep hurting myself. And it's not necessarily that prison, as we think of it, changed yeah. them, right? It's that A, they were interrupted in the path and B, they encountered a mentor often, yeah. or a, and that could be a fellow incarcerated person, often yeah. is, yeah. though they encountered a book, yeah. or they encountered something friends or family yeah. sent in, that there was some transformative force in the interruption yeah. of life. And can we do that without the use of prisons, yeah. is the real really question, I think. Question. That. Yeah. Well, for me, it was the community and my family. 
Yeah. I, you know, and, and um, it was sad because there was a lot of people prison that uh, don't have any of that. And they're just lost. And so it, it is important that the work that you're all doing, going in there, uh, helping them and, and, and you know, sharing with them what you all uh, have to teach and everything. Because sometimes that's all they have. There's nothing else that they have that, you know, helps them get through the day. You know, one thing about prison, yeah, it could be violent. And there are a lot of things that happen. But the worst thing about it is the boredom. Yeah. There's a lot of boredom. There's nothing to do. You're stuck in your thoughts. You're stuck in your mind. A lot of people here talk about that's how they found reading. You're also (laughs) stuck with your hurt, your pain, your regrets, your shame, humiliation, all of these things. And you have no way to let all of that out. So it's good that you all, you know, are are able to go in there. With with Illinois, there's not a lot of those programs. Illinois doesn't have a lot. That's why you are bringing me to my point there you go. <laughs> which is that thank yeah. you for that intro and forgive yeah. me for jumping in no, it's okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. is that if you're outside of a major city where all yeah. the artists are who who are interested in these opportunities who get it you yeah. get programming deserts yeah. so we started to think about what is a, what is a and, and there's a history for this you know this had a predecessor that was self-published and very small and very different but the idea was already there to send something where people And I said, how do we make a book that has, there's a whole chapter on building writing community of prisons with exercises, with how to do a writing group. And it it is meant to be a blueprint, instructional manual, exactly for folks who don't have that coming in. So, you know, I think about books that I've like, you know, been like this with because they've become so important to me. And that's what I hope this would become in the, not just me, me and all the folks who worked on it, you know, exactly what you're saying where folks, uh, that taste of the outside world and people coming in is so vibrant and so exciting in prison for folks. But not ever, but most places, I would actually say, don't have programming. So yeah. what gaps and, can and we you know, fill with this book? Also, what you're saying is very important. I'm sure I mean, when those guys really appreciate this. Oh, yeah. They, I come in there and they don't, they're so happy to know you made your time, you're here, and they always remind me. We're so glad you're here. Thank you. They love that the people are paying attention. You're teaching. You're interacting with them. They love it. They they really want it. And almost every prison should have programming like this as part of even the abolition is get this change. Well, because listen, there. these folks yeah. are all coming home. We we yeah. we close prison down. We want. Exactly. I, I use the word comrade. That's intense. We need leaders in the movement who yeah. are you know, able to step into that position. What are you going to do with all those people in your movement when they come home? We want to be building allies inside, Absolutely. you know? And, you know, in, in prison, there are a lot of revolutionaries. Oh, yeah. Artists, poets. Yeah. And they're stuck in there. You yeah. know, I mean, you know, it's it, it's sad, you know, because they can contribute and, um, and, be, and make sure, and really help a lot of people. If they can... Just get the opportunity, even if they have to be stuck behind their, the bars. You know, um, some of them are doing crimes where they're going to have to be there for a long time. But you'd be surprised uh, how many people have really changed their mindset, their attitude. You know, and it's hard. It, it, it's a balance. It's hard, especially for the victims, for people that have, are, you know, don't want to deal with that, don't want to deal with somebody who just hurt them and their family. You know, so it's hard. It's a balance that we have to learn how to. Uh, shuffle through you know, yeah so. and I think that's really relevant and I think that my sense is that victims need writing just as much as perpetrators and victims and perpetrators as we know that's a secular concept yeah. you know everybody's it's not a so victim clean in some way everybody's a perpetrator and then, yeah, it's a, and you know what I love about what you're saying is that if we're going to do this transform the world we got to include victims we do because people think it's just about working with the prisoners but then the pain the hurt uh, I People just, have done really yeah. bad, difficult things oh. that we need to contend with. And I think yeah. that when that's under talked about, yeah. it cheapens our abolition yeah. work. And I think what I love about what's in this book is so many of the contributors write into yeah. that sentiment about, you know, yeah. how writing helped them take responsibility for what they've done. Yeah. And, I, and here's the other thing, responsibility to do good themselves now. To yeah. me, that's a deep part. Yes. One thing is to say, I did something terrible. I'm, I apologize. I'm sorry. But the other part was, I'm going to be, I, I used to say that I, I didn't do all the state prison terms that he did. I was formerly incarcerated. I did county jail time. I was saved by the community. They came and they were there to help me. And I never looked back. 
But I always say that I've sentenced myself to a lifetime of community service because yes. that's partly what a lot of these men and yes. women end up doing. This is look at I, I did terrible things. I know I owe the world something, but let me pay back, not pay back with my own gifts. That's really the key. Yeah. And exactly. And and one of my core philosophies is that you have to move from your own passion and, and what makes you feel good in order to real, really make a contribution. But that is so counter to what we say people need. We say they need punishment. Regret. I mean, people need to go through their process, obviously. They're not going to drop into feeling great or they shouldn't. You have to go through a reconciliation. But there's a sense of sometimes I get the question, you know, why do you give platform to incarcerated writers who've done terrible things? Or why, you know, why should they be writing? Let them do something else. And I'm like, yeah. well, I believe we have to operate our biggest gifts and, yeah. and our capacity to create positive change comes from what we love to do. Yeah. And and I believe everyone deserves a shot at that. Yeah. yeah. Just, just, you know, especially when it comes to like funding and grants, everybody's looking for quantification. Yeah. So there's the proof. It's in those writings, in the books. This is quantified. We're showing you the quality of work that's that's changing people's lives. You know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And get and, this. The Mellon Foundation funded 75,000 copies of these to go into prisons for free across the U.S. The book has been out, what, it came out January 11th, a little over a month. We already have 50,000 requests for free books, so we need more money. <laughs> no, but this is really the point, to get people to be aware of the book, that we're out there, people who are in the book are people who are, some of them are incarcerated. Some formerly incarcerated. Some are MacArthur geniuses. Some yeah. just won the biggest LA award. You know. Yeah. <laughs> we have but you know, we're also working. Like for example, uh, I just present this other book, which it's a theater to press book, but I don't mind saying it. This is an anthology that I helped create of writing yes. for my class. It's called Make a Poem Cry, and Kenneth Harbin, the co-editor of this book. He's an art book. Uh, hey, the art book. I, this is our book, and he did. Um, 38 years. I mean, the guy was alive without possibly parole. He, but when I met him many, many years ago, he showed up in my class. He was like the best human being. Well, I don't want to say everybody's really good human being, but he was so good, so honorable, and a great writer. He is so many people's yeah. mentor in prison. Yeah. And I had heard about him for years before we got to meet. Yeah, and those are the good stories. Yeah. I mean, the terrible things that he had done and as a young man, he understands. He's he's. He's had to reconcile with some terrible things, but he, the way he does it is that now I got to give back. I got to help others. I have to give back, and that's really the the drive of a lot of the guys. Even him, I mean, he gives back all the time. You know, it's a constant thing. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to see about maybe you reading something else that might be appropriate to what we're saying here. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Oh, okay, and I'm going to let my son go. For oh, yes, yeah, yeah. you, you can exit <laughs> yeah, stage if you. you'd like. You know, it's very hard to do this, and then you have somebody like my son sitting here <laughs> without bringing them up because, um, yeah. But. I'm going to read a little. Um, I'm going to read a little piece from, well, I want to give a little sense. I'm trying to figure out where to enter this piece. Um that one won't work. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read a little of Alejo Rodriguez's oh, opening please. because he says, and still I write creative expression for self-advocacy. I mean, there are so many points we touched on that we could go into, but why I want to bring this up is because there's been a lot of talk about writing as spirituality, writing as like bringing the core of somebody to the fore, writing as contribution. Alejo's essay is called And Still I Write, Creative Expression for Self-Advocacy. He's an incredible advocate, works with an organization, Zealous Now. He did about over three decades. And he wrote a whole essay about how poetry helped him finally make the parole board after 13 attempts. And this is one of the smartest, most compelling people I know. So here's a late, can I curse? Or should I bleep? No, no, go ahead. I can curse? Audience? Yeah. <laughs> the few yeah, of you here. All right, great. Okay. It says, every love poem is a love poem. These were the words of a guest poet who came to our workshop in Knapp, that is, the Eastern Correctional Facility in New York. My gut reaction was like, love poems? Man, I was there to spit fire. Call it poetry if you want to, but I was there to use my writing to sort through some real shit. My anger, my distrust of anything institutional, my questioning of myself, were my values really my values, or just some things I adopted from other people. 
Why was it that I couldn't shake the voice in my head talking about how we'd been in prison before, even though this was my first time? And here goes this poetry cat talking about every poem is a love poem. Yeah, I. So he goes on to talk about, you know, feeling free through writing. And, um, and here's where he kind of comes back to around, where he's a plural board. For decades until that point, I'd been searching to express myself in terms that I thought the parole board would want to hear without command of how I actually express myself. I began to re-examine key words that the board would use in their denial explanations like lack of remorse or lack of insight. Mm. Throughout my bid, I had certainly wrestled with these words. They had a living, breathing presence. And so I was disappointed to learn that both words were nouns, a person, place, or static thing contained mm. within a limited existence. In my heart, though, I understood these words to be verbs, in motion, actionable, evolving. I knew that remorse, for example, is far more than saying the words, I'm sorry. Remorse showed up in who I surrounded myself with, the seemingly small choices I made, the big goals I set. I also understood insight as illumination that expands over time, the connecting of dots between the root concepts of life lessons and making conscious how they influence our daily decisions. Insight was understanding why I chose to involve myself in volunteer programs outside of what I was mandated, or why I spoke up not just for myself, but also for others locked up. Mm -hmm. And the essay goes on to actually lay out bullet points of practical how you can use writing for advocacy and tells the story of coming home. But I think he really captures what we were talking about just now, right? This sense of, of people often ask me, like, why do you work with writers in prison? What is it about it? And I think... I'd like to have a more like a political answer sometimes, but the answer really honestly is that I was so moved by meeting people who'd done things that had previously been unthinkable to me, that I would be friends with somebody who had murdered or raped. And then I got to know them well and understood who they were in this moment in their life and fell in love with so many people and their talents. And I thought it just rearranged my entire brain and heart and manner of thinking. And I thought, and it's a thought that gets me through the day sometimes when I've struggled with depression or mental health. And I'm like, man, if my friends could come through having yeah. done some really terrible things and reconciled to the point where they are, I have so much to learn from them. And I am so yeah. lucky, you know? You know, it's one of the reasons why uh, in my essay, I have these prompts that are not your normal prompts. They are beautiful. You should They're give a taste not... of one. They're yeah. so good. Because uh, people have all these prompts like, you see a bird up a tree, what's your first thought that happened? I don't know, you know, I can't. I There's can't a bird in a tree. I have to give prompts that are, uh, well, they call it social emotive. I don't even know if that's the right word. That really open them up. Yes. And like, for example, um, the simple one is put them on a crossroads. They're all on a crossroads. But you actually put them in the crossroads and say, what are you, what are you facing? When you're in the crossroads, you have to make decisions about where you're going or not going. Otherwise, you're stuck there. And many of them will say, well, I'm stuck in the crossroads. I don't know where to go. Well, what are you facing? You put them in the horns of a dilemma. Yeah. What? The horns of a dilemma. That's where no matter what you choose, it's going to go, something's going to go bad. And you know what they say? That's been my whole life. Yes. Okay, so how do you deal with that? How do you write yourself out of that? I put them on a train. I call it the train of life where you're on a train and you're making three stops. And each stop is a part of your life, a marker in your life. But what you do is you're dropping off baggage and picking up baggage. What are you dropping off and what are you picking up at each stop? It could be when they first went to school, when they first fell in love, when they first went to prison, whatever it might be. These things are engaging at a, a deeper level. They're I mean, but just... the framework of storytelling is brilliant. I yeah, think that I have my former intern, Alec, here with us live. And uh, I think we, we wrote to some of those prompts just in our team for yeah. fun. And, you know, also speaking to socio-emotional, these are the questions that do rock a soul. And we, when I used to teach in a women's prison for years, our ritual was going to get a roll of toilet paper from the bathroom and putting it in the center of the circle because somebody was always crying and somebody was always laughing. Most of us were usually laughing. And I think your prompts really capture that. You know, what movement. I learned is that a metaphor at some kind of level is where you really get into I If I ask them, tell me what your worst thing in your life or what your life is about, they're not going to answer. But you put them in a metaphor, and the metaphor opens them up, and that's what's important. Metaphor is also, Luis, is also safety. Yeah. Thinking true. about prison and who's raiding your cell and who's raiding your work and who's censoring mm -hmm. what's coming out and going in and 
who might get a hold of it and oh shit you're in trouble because your secrets are out there and it's a place of survival all these threats I always said learn how to use metaphor because that's how you can stay safe and tell your story exactly. so it's, it's so it's safety to open up and it's safety in a really literal sense too so one of the things I do is uh, the facing part initially you know which is a mexica indigenous concept but what's important in prison is they totally get it face and heart is that that's the word for initially you know is what the mexica would call a person but what that means is your face and heart is it aligned you know because we present ourselves we have a way of showing representing but is it really aligned to who you are and that's a struggle they're always waging because they see you in others this person presents himself a certain way, but I know that's not really them. And they love the idea that you can align these things. Your heart and your face could be aligned. And when they get close to it, they show it. Their face actually shows what the heart is. Yeah. And the heart actually is what their face is representing. You know, they love what they can't stand is the hypocrisies, the two-sidedness, the, you know, the, the backstabbing way of doing things, even with yourself. And so it's a great concept because they, they totally get it. I know what you're saying. But talk about how, how you know, I, that's what I was talking about, your chapter being so unique and so uh, really opened me up. How do you use that Mashika metaphor of heart and face yeah. within the craft context? It's wonderful. Yeah. Well, because part of the thing is that I don't want to get away from that writing is a craft. Again, the, it's inside of them what they write, their stories, who they are. It's they got it's a lifeline they really have. But then I always tell people, uh, at a certain point you gotta make a decision, and that decision is, am I gonna be good at what I do? It's a you yourself as a human being are the masterpiece you're trying to make. And they love that because again, they want to master their world. They lived in a world that chaos and everything else ruled, and also they were like following along with other things. They gave themselves up to other things. Mm. Now they have to give themselves up to them. And you got to be a master of who you are. And they love this stuff. Everybody loves this stuff because they want to be that master. They want to say, I want to master my world, my life. I want to be a master of my art. That to me is what's really important. And so it works when they can see that, oh, it's within me. I own my life. Nobody owns it. I have to own the bad and the good. I have to own everything I've been through. Because like it, when I was on the street, I can tell you I turned my life over to a gang. I turned my life over to heroin. Mm -hmm. I turned my life over to everything outside of me. And, you know, it, it seems like the cool thing, but then I realized what a, and as I got older, what a cowardly thing it was for me. And don't people do yeah. that in all kinds of ways that aren't heroin in prison, but are like yes. seemingly innocuous? It's That's the way exactly that right. our society operates. Yeah. What you're saying is this yeah. is, is what's normal, really what we want. Right. And I think, you know, these might be on, we might see them on different scales or there's different rhetoric. I used to teach at a needle exchange um, yeah. in Washington Heights in New York. And the training really spoke to me through, I was working in prison at the time too, and the parallels to it. And there was, we, there was an exercise where we did, you know, list all the drugs you take, yeah. and the Advil, this, that, you know, all the, yeah. all the legal drugs, right. cough, syrup. And then we did a, a list of all these drugs that, that folks that were coming into the center were taking. Yeah. And, uh, and what they said was both lists, the accomplishment of taking any of these drugs is to feel better. Yeah. And I, you know, and that the harm reduction was their model. And I think there was something so instructive to me yeah. about that framework. And I'm glad to remember it tonight because it's so easy for folks to say, well, I don't do that, but do you drink a bottle of wine every night or do, you yeah. know, there's so many ways in which all of us are contending or with even, these very even same things. the themes. workaholics who oh, hide yeah. in their work. Or I remember one time I was talking to somebody and somebody gets up, suit and tie, nice guy, and says, why does it bother these gang members? They all look alike. They all act alike. They all... So I <laughs> looked like... at him and I go, hey, hey, you know, just so you know, well, I asked him what his position, he was an insurance salesperson. I go, well, I'm sorry, but you look like every insurance person I've ever met. <laughs> you're doing I'm the like same thing the that you're putting these gang kids down. You know, so, you know, you're just in a different gang, maybe. Maybe you're, you know, the people don't realize that they're actually doing these things that they're blaming kids for doing. But you know, the, the idea of being that we're- But we're, and ga gangs have leadership that's skewed. Yeah. If you can get to a gang leader and transform a gang leader, like I'm, I'm banking on my friends in this book, giving it to the guys on the yard. You know, yeah, you yeah. gotta read this because yeah. and, and that's the, and a that, that is a powerful energy that's been, you know, 
woefully misdirected because yeah. of societal landscape. Yeah. Now, yeah. if you understand politics in prison, which I know you understand, you have to pay attention. I don't talk about this. I know what's happening. I know who's who. So at some of these prisons, these high security prisons in California, people come and audit you. They won't say it's audited. They're watching you. They're running the yard. They have people come in and audit you. Is this really cool or is it just... And you can't... You got to be careful what you say, but if you say some really deep, genuine things, they go back and tell other people, this is really That's good. That's right. They go back and say, and these are the guys running things. They actually tell people, go to that class. It's amazing what they do because you would think, oh, don't go there, there. But they, they audit you and they said, no, this guy is, or this woman, because sometimes it could be a woman, uh, they're teaching you something really real. You could, and they even tell people, go in there, go. Mm. And so it's always been a situation where I don't have to worry about it as long as I'm genuine, I'm real. I don't talk about things I don't need to talk about, but when I'm talking about the stuff we're talking about and it opens up the world and they see it happening, and then when they get go in there, and men and women, but men don't have the same... Uh, the women in prisons, I know, they do cry, they have emotional, men hold it back. Right? Absolutely. But I tell you what, they hold it back, but they have another way of bringing it out. Yeah. And when it comes out and people see that, there's a genuine transformation. You know, when men get emotional in their own way, it transforms the whole room. And it takes that courage, that one person. And I'll tell you one, I'll tell you one really quick story. Tell uh, me all the stories. Yeah, so, I'm here. so here's a guy, uh, hard-nosed, you know, he's black. He's been in uh, Pelican Bay. He's been all the rough places. So he says, I, I'm going to read something. I wanted to commit suicide when I was in Pelican Bay, and I never told anybody. But I'm okay telling people now. I'm through it. I went through it. I'm, I'm okay. I don't mind. It doesn't take his manhood away. But he could never tell people that. So he read this really beautiful thing. And he was in Sardar, uh, I mean, in uh, Pelican Bay for like six years in solitary mm -hmm. confinement, which is really horrible. Cool. But this one Chicano guy gets up because my classes are generally black and brown. I have Asians and whites, but they're all great. But black and brown. This one Chicano guy uh, who I know did 34 years in prison. Mm -hmm. He stands up, and you're always worried about the black and brown politics, but it never seems to get away. But you pay attention. I hear it's really bad in California. Yeah. So he gets up, and this guy was a heavy duty, you know, 34 years. You know, you can see it in his face. Been through. He gets up and he walks over to the black guy. We're all talking, but then we're all got quiet. We don't know what's going to happen. He goes up to him and hugs him because he did 26 years in solitary confinement. Ooh. And he didn't say, hey, I did 26 years more than you. He says, what well, you wrote, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. He went and hugged him. They, those are transformative moments. Those are moments that, and the guys, you know that they want to Cry, you could, but there's probably tears, but they're not going to, but then you know they're feeling it, and that's what you, you wait These for. are the stories, right, where when, when people come back with a, well, people should go be punished, and you think, what does being punished do but shut a person down? And, you know, you always have to put it back on the person asking the question, have you ever changed because you were punished? Yeah. You think about putting somebody in a room like that in a different context, and that gentleness and that opening and breaking through that toxic masculine of our society yeah. That is, I mean, yeah. that's what we need. Yeah. That we need that outside. We need, we that, need everywhere. that everywhere. Absolutely. We need that everywhere. But if you can do it in prison, you can do it in prison. Well, exactly. It's like New York City. You can make it there. You can make it anywhere. Yeah, there you go. There you go. <laughs> you can make a best friend in prison. In LA, we have another idea. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to start an LA, oh. New York warrior. But, uh, but speaking of which, so I love New York City. It's a great city, and I'm really glad that Kate's there. I'm wondering if we want, uh, do you have any questions either from the audience or if, do we have questions from anybody online? Uh, I don't have much questions for you, so I want to say that. Okay. Um, um, Moody Baxter? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was one of my students. Oh, yeah. yeah Moody? He just got, yeah, great he just name. Got out, I just got out of prison. Yeah, Welcome home, Moody. Him. He's a great guy. Yeah, he thinks that as a former incarcerated writer, it took me years to find motivation to write. I felt inhibited by my desperation and my emptiness. However, I found relief and inspiration by confronting my circumstances rather than writing around them. And by internalizing the painful parts of my life, I gained a deeper understanding of Beautiful. Beautiful. Please what say. a testimony. Yeah. yeah. What and, a testimony. And, and that's what happens if you do this long enough. You get 
these great experiences, meet these amazing people. The story, I mean, you and I could probably trade stories all day. It would be wonderful, each one of them. Yes, so exactly. Th thank you, Booty. Thank you, brother. He's, uh, he's out in the world, and he's doing good. He's doing good. We're glad way. you're home. Again, we don't want to just talk about all the terrible, sad things. There's the most people who... No, do never. Yeah. All, all the folks I know who've spent time inside yeah. are tremendous people, and yeah. I've learned a lot, and yeah. they're a lot of... A lot of good work is being done in the world, yeah. Yeah, so I don't know if anybody here in, the, in our audience got a question. Uh, so I, I wanted to ask you, uh, in reference to the, the blueprint in the book uh, and being in the knowing uh, professional system, what do you think would be, perhaps personally, the biggest challenge to implement uh, stuff that comes that is in the blueprint in the book, in, in the Illinois system? Come back on this stage. Is, this is to my son, Ramiro. I love this. This is beautiful yeah. family yeah. style. I'm really into it. Uh, thank you again. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, the biggest issue really is just, it's, it's really like political, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't, they, the first programs that get cut when it comes to budget cuts and things like that around the state is in the prison system in Illinois. When I first was, when I first got, um, went into prison, and they had guitar lessons, I was, you know, learning how to paint, you know, it was a little bit more open, but uh, once, like, especially around 2008, when they had all the crisis of the housing, and everything, that, I mean, they came in and cut all of these programs, and, and then, you know, so they weren't allowing us to really, you know, be a part of anything, you know, and then they also, too, like, they're very strict, uh, uh, strict on what is allowed to come in you know i know my dad's book is hard to get in there um, it's actually bad yeah. in the in a lot of prisons i believe it yeah so i mean so i mean i'm not sure if this book will be allowed i mean hopefully it will be and if it is then you know it does take guys who are in there to be able to try to have you know some kind of like circles or workshops with other guys in there but you know what you know my prisons too they're locked down you don't get an opportunity even to associate that much like they used to. I mean, I know, of course, there was a lot of things that were happening with, you know, with the fights, riot, and all the things. So that's why they did a lot of it. But a lot of those things were because people were angry at what the, the prison system and what was doing mm -hmm. to them and how they were being treated. So, so, so guys are getting punished for trying to express themselves that you're already, we're, pun we're already being punished as it is, but now we're tre being treated more than... You know, just more than being human, you know, you're, de you're, you're dehumanizing us, you're degrading us, you know. And then, you know, uh, especially if you go down south in Illinois to a lot of those towns, mm -hmm. it's KKK country. It's been mm -hmm. like that for years. Southern Illinois has a lot of racist problems, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, they people live in Egypt because they actually grew cotton. Really? And even though it's in the north, they had a lot of uh, cotton, black uh, farmers and everything. Yeah, huh. yeah. Didn't know that. So yeah, so it's not just the southern, like in Mississippi and Alabama. So you know, Illinois is such a melting pot of so many different diversity, you know. And then, and then of course, like you know, the only really biggest city is Chicago, of course, you know. And that uh, it's not like California, Texas, all these big states where you have all these other different cities that people gravitate toward. Chicago is pretty much the main one, and so that becomes another issue because um, at times. Illinois is a red state. Chicago is a blue city. You know what I'm saying? So, so there's all these different uh, uh, demographics that 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 happen that are very hard for us to really get any good uh, traction of a program to come in. And even just spiritually, mm -hmm. for instance, uh, I'm a Shika. and when I went in there, they they, they tell you. They have a, your ID card. I don't know how it is in other prisons, but I don't know. No, no, they give you, you know, when you have your ID card, in the back of it, you could put like your religious, you know, affiliation, which you would. So I wanted them to put Mashika. I used to get into it with the, the, the priest in there because they really wanted me to be a part of the Native American church. I'm not a part of the Native American church. I'm not into Christianity. I'm not. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Shika. It's, 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 it's ancient. It's old. It's, it's in my blood. It's who we are. I'm rooted to the energies of my, <laughs> my people. That's what I believe in. That's my spirituality. I'm not religious. And I really wanted to. So what they did on my back of my car was they put other. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But this is how it is in Illinois. I mean, these are the things that we're dealing with, you know? 
And and yeah, so I'm just giving you all some examples of what happens. Thank you. Yeah. I also think you you bring up um some things that touch on a powerful concept, which is that I think prisons are afraid of life and life energy and life force and creativity because writing is power. And so, you know, a nice rehabilitative program is cute and sweet, lovely. Give the inmates some skills. You know, we could package it that way. Yeah. But if a warden is sharp or an education director is sharp, they're going to realize the education is, is going to be tough because you get people who are now sharpening their skills and their minds and able to use the law and able... It's a real threat to them. So, you know... We will see if this book gets in. It's 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 a waiting game right well, now. I mean, you I, know. What, what, so what ended up happening is that they cut a lot of the school. Yeah. Before it used to be state funded, and people can get the schooling. So now what they ended up doing was making like the universities and colleges that are next to those prisons pay and and provide the school. It hasn't come out of their own pocket. So some of those universities, colleges were doing, it, and they still probably are. So it's good. There are some. So 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 that's probably how some of these books can come in, but yeah. but you have to go through that. You know what I'm saying? Actually, and, the cover speaks to this because with everything coming in and out, the way that things still come in out of prison is mail. Yeah. So that was the symbology. This is actual mail we've been sent that we mm -hmm. scanned, and and created these butterflies coming out of prison because yeah. often the way to get your voice heard, right, is not. It's going to be through this old school method of letter writing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great. No, well, thank, thank you for that question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I think, I guess what we want to do is advocate for people. If you know institutions and you know people, find a way to get the book in there. And also, if you're a writer and interested in this topic, buy the book. All proceeds yeah. go back to getting these books inside for free. And as I've been told by multiple people, uh, Michelle Alexander, for one, said this is one of the best books on writing I've ever read. So the the lessons in here, and I hope I gave a taste. Like it's written towards people in prison yeah. by people who've had the experience, but it really is it is a book about how to be a better writer and a better human. A better human being. Yeah. That, and I'll tell you, maybe, maybe I don't know where we're at an ending time. Are we? I wouldn't talk, and we don't even know. We have no idea you have to help us. Are we? Okay, so so let me just say one of the things I do tell people, and again because of religious stuff, I don't want to get into. It, but a lot of people, different religions, come in there, and I honor all of them. They're all valid to me, and people don't have religion, they come in there. But I tell them, what is the goal of every religion, of every art, and everything? People think about what is that goal? I say, well, is it to be a better Christian, to be a better Buddhist, to be a better uh, Muslim? No. All of it is to make you a better human being. Yeah. To be a better, more decent, more whole, more complete, more healthy. All of them are trying to get there. There's different ways of going there. And if you go this religion, that takes you there. Obviously, if it's Christianity and you and you want to be a better human being, you're going to be a better Christian. But that's not the goal. I tell you honestly. It's a tool, they're it, tools and philosophies they're tools that, that guide us, right? Be, yeah. Better human being, you know, and decency. You know, that's why I really have problems with people who claim religion and like the worst human beings in the world. I know there's so many of them, unfortunately. It's a face and heart thing. They seem anyway. to be everywhere. Yeah, you guys presenting yourself a certain way, but you're a contradiction to your own self. So it's even true for institutions that they got to be real. Oh, yeah. And I'll tell you, speaking of institutions, Penn, America, and Kate Meisner and the Prison Writing Projects, they are real. That's the important part. That's, that, uh, can yeah. I put that on my bio? <laughs> yes. Says Luis J. Rodriguez. Yeah, because I mean, this is what we're talking about. How to be genuine in a world that's so ingenuous. There's so much lies and hypocrisy. But you know, speaking you know. of this, Luis, and I, I want to bring up race because I don't usually volunteer it because it can get contentious. But um, as a white person in this work, um, there were there are so there were so many conversations that other people other white people have had with me about their anxieties or why they go in can I go into prison and do this work? And as you mentioned earlier, the gratitude that's felt is like you didn't forget me. Thank you. You're seeing me person to person. And my sense is that now, although there's a lot of race complexity in prison, as we know, especially in California, as I understand it, but everywhere that when those relationships get forged through literal walls, when those relationships get forged through metaphorical walls, 
this is where like the most radical human to human work is being done in relationships. Exactly. And it takes away the, yeah. the race falls down. It does. I mean, there might be the first thing they look at. Here's a white woman. What does she know? I mean, that happens. Well, I have a great story about yeah. being in the San Francisco men's jail. Okay. I came in looking like me, and I had just done a workshop with 25 men. And the, the way I get my props was always to just raise my sleeves because then there was an instant conversation starter. Okay. Oh, well, let me see your ink. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And everybody else in the room had their tattoos. And yeah, yeah. so I found my ways to break the ice. Yeah. But then I get up and, and we're in the housing unit, which looks like a, like a fishbowl because in, in the San Francisco men's jail, it's, it's not bars, it's glass. It's yeah. very upset, even more yeah. upsetting in some ways. Yeah. Strange. But we're in the housing unit. There's like 50 men in the audience. There's Then I, I'm starting to perform and I see... It's before, but I'm being introduced before. And I started actually singing, which I knew would get people's attention. Ooh. I don't do it all the time, but uh, I saw a young man who looked like he was 18, like trying to catch someone's eye, a young black man, trying to be like, who's this? <laughs> and I got it. You know, he used to yeah. teach high school in the South Bronx. So I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I'm not worried about you. But he, and I saw this moment. It was so profound. He caught an elder's eye, an elder black man who looked yeah. at him and looked at him with this dead serious face and shook yeah. his head like, don't you dare and the kid yeah. put his eyes down and then he looked up and he was with it for the rest of the time yeah, yeah. There, were, there and i think that what uh what that look was was not that many people come in here yeah. take to take the moment to connect and see beyond it and there was this silent mentorship happening between generations there was this moment that was humbling for me and i i think that there's this misconception that uh that you can, that you know, there's something about prison work that yeah. really bridges that gap. No, I, I totally agree, and I think this is a good way to maybe kind of end here because it's kind of a we can keep going. We could, but to All me, night. the human heart is the entry point. And the human heart is where you're connected. And that is what you take away. And eventually all the things that you come in there with don't matter if you're not genuine, authentic, as you point out. If you can't show genuine respect, respect is big. Respect enough. is everything. And I'm respectful to everybody. And guess what? They give you respect back. Um, and, it, and I have to say this because in the beginning when I started 40 years ago, I didn't get support from the COs, the correction officers. Mm -hmm. The, the, there's a warden or some staff that wanted to be in there. They gave me, they would sabotage me. They would, they would do things like not call out the, the, the incarcerated people, and, but all kinds of things happened. But I would say over 40 years when people got to know me and see me, I won over some of these CEOs. They need this book too. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, they, they, They're hurting. In one prison. of them came up to me, and, it, and I'm in a high security yard. Uh, I don't do it no more, unfortunately, since the pandemic, but high security yard here at Lancaster, you know, high end. They call it level four, which is the highest end. And um, one or two of them are like, man, they're questioning what I do. But, you know, but what happened is one guy comes up to me and says, I'm going to tell you something. These guys come into your class. They're solemn. They're grumpy. They're, but they come out laughing and they're happy. Something changes in them. And he kept noticing that every week that they come. And he finally came and says, I love what you're doing. I don't know what you're doing. Because I don't have the guards in, in my you class. You probably create a space where people forget they're in prison for a few hours and yeah. and can love themselves and, again. And they, and they love see others. their humanity come out. And they realize, you know what? And some of them COs get it. They, they're under tension. They're under stress. They don't know half the time when they're going to make it. And and then they can see people become fuller in their humanity. Even their humanity gets a little fuller. And so some of them begin to support what I was doing. And in other words, I don't want to knock down anybody, including staff. Uh, I did have a hard time. I, I don't mind telling people, but you start winning. They're indoctrinated over. too. Yeah. You guys yeah. win them over to win them over to, and they need healing. Need to, they are these people are doing sixteen hour days. Absolutely. They're getting pee thrown on them sometimes. They see all they, kinds they of stuff. stuff. And and, uh, you can tell your heart and I'm not I'm not a CEO sympathizer per se, but yeah. if I believe that the folks in prison deserve to have their humanity, then I damn sure better believe that everybody involved in the ecosystem yeah. needs their humanity back. Yeah. That's how it's going to change. So the world. when when uh, when when the last place I went to the captain of the ship he comes and talks to me because he wasn't liking what i was doing mm -hmm. but his daughter was reading my book in school and she came to him and said, this is the best book ever and then he made the connection wait a minute that's the guy that comes in this oh that's prison. wild so he read the book 
And then he comes to me, this is the captain, and he said, I'm going to tell you something, and I want to apologize. I did not like what you were doing, but I read your book. And it's an amazing story. Wow. And I, now I, you're here, and I thought you're too big famous to come in here. And you come in here to do this, and look at it. I, I just like to deal with human beings, wherever they may be. And then he shows up to a play that I did on my book. He shows up with his daughter and his family. Wow. And he came to me one day and says, whatever you need, I'm there for you. If anybody gives you a hard time like the CEOs, if anybody gives you a hard time, let me know. I'm not going to do that. But I mean, in other words, you transform lives down the line. Everybody gets transformed when you, you do this kind of work. So Agreed. And I get transformed. Period. By the way. And I'm, we get transformed. Yeah. Are you kidding? This book, this yeah. book editing it liberated me to say there's a lot i'm not saying that i need to get braver in my own writing and i need to really own myself as an artist in a way I, I, how could i not how could i edit a book on liberation through writing in prison and not become more liberated myself that's a yes. gift i got from so this work. maybe it's a way anybody interested in this work you get transformed and that's important yeah. and this is the the best book out there i would have to say i've written a lot of Read a lot of books about this work. Writing, this is the best one. Uh, please get it, but also do whatever you can to get into the prisons. And anybody wants to do that work, please do it. It really is transformative at all levels. And Kate, I want to say thank you. Thank, thank you, you for making it happen. Thank you for always being there. Thank you for being the person you are. Thank you for opening these doors. Thank you for being that great human being for a lot of people. And uh, thank you, Romino, for joining us. Man, do I say just reflect that all yeah. back to you both. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you all for being here and, and your questions. And thank you all. Please come back to Theo Chuches whenever. Look at our it's website. It's beautiful Find here. Out. you got to come it's in here. It's full of color and murals yeah. and paintings. I'm going to take a million photos. And we got the most wonderful staff, I have to tell you. Yes, I you love do. every one of them. You know why? Shout out wonderful? to Karen. Karen and everybody that's <laughs> here. Uh, yeah. One thing I want to say, the reason why the great staff, they love this space. If you don't love what you do, you're not going to make it but if you love it you put your heart in it it'll it'll happen come in full circle there you go yeah. thank you all thank you lots of commodities we say mm -hmm.